Have you ever wondered how an electrical crater is formed? Even if you might disagree with the idea of electricity forming craters on a large scale, say craters one kilometer in diameter and larger, the fact remains that electricity can produce craters on a small scale. Understanding how this process plays out will help us make predictions and determine if observations are pointing us in the direction of an electrical origin of craters. In this video, we are going to be looking at two solar system bodies. One where we can make a prediction, and another where we can make an observation. These bodies are the Psyche asteroid and Mars' moon Phobos. We have already seen Phobos up close, so we can make observations of existing images. On the other hand, we have not been to the Psyche asteroid, but NASA currently has a mission en route to this rock, which gives us some room to make predictions about what its surface may look like if it's been scarred electrically. Both bodies have different compositions, and therefore electrical scarring will have a different effect on each body, as we will see when we uncover the interworkings of electrical theory. Some of the information I'm about to present might not be new to most of you watching, and may even seem superfluous, and a few disclaimers are necessary. The first is that the following information is from an electrical engineering handbook that was published in 1977, titled Electricity 1-7. through and some of the details of electrical theory may have changed a bit since then, but I'm confident the theory holds up and the information is still of good value. The second is that this is a crash course on the theory and brushes over a handful of sections of the book, so buckle up. I encourage anyone to comment with questions, clarifications, or additions to the following dialogue. I will start by saying that electricity is not magic. I know. Sad. Electricity is a specific transfer of energy from atom to atom, or from compounds and molecules by way of electric fields. The electric fields come from particles that make up the internal structure of the atom. These particles are known as protons and electrons, and are found in all materials. The proton is found at the nucleus of the atom, is positively charged, and produces positive lines of force that go straight out from the proton in all directions. The electron orbits about the nucleus, is negatively charged, and produces negative lines of force that travel into the electron from all directions. These positive and negative charges are governed by the law of attraction. Like charges will repel each other, and opposite charges will attract each other. It's important to understand that the number of protons in an atom determine what element the atom is. The list of all the elements and their specific number of protons are listed in the periodic table of elements. The more protons an atom has will determine how many electrons will orbit about the nucleus, and this will have an effect on how the atom will interact chemically with other elements. An atom can have extra electrons or a deficiency of electrons. On the contrary, if an atom were to lose or gain protons, it will change its elemental properties. Atoms will tend to be neutral, meaning that they have the same number of protons and electrons. The positive and negative charges can be added together to create a net electric charge that equals zero. If an atom loses or gains electrons, it will have a positive or negative net charge. If there are extra electrons, a net negative. If less electrons, a net positive. Focusing in on the negative charges, electrons don't just orbit about the nucleus in a chaotic and disorganized manner, but reside in what are referred to as orbital shells. Electrons can be freed from these shells by applying an external force. The electrons that are closest to the nucleus are difficult to free because the attractive force of the proton is stronger. As atoms increase in mass, more orbital shells form that are farther away from the nucleus. Atoms of the known elements can have up to seven shells. I think it's necessary to quote directly from the text of Electricity 1.7 to adequately explain the workings of orbital shells. Quote, if you study the periodic table of elements briefly, you will notice that each shell can only hold a certain number of electrons. The shell closest to the nucleus, the first shell, cannot hold more than two electrons. The second shell cannot hold more than eight electrons. The third, no more than 18. The fourth, no more than 32, and so on. As you can notice in the periodic table, 
Although the sh third shell can hold up to 18 electrons, it did not take on any more than 8 electrons until the fourth shell started. This is also true of the fourth shell. It will not take on any more electrons than 8 until the fifth shell starts, even though the fourth shell can hold up to 32 electrons. This shows that there is a rule. The outer shell of an atom will have no more than 8 electrons. The outer shell of an atom is called the valence shell, and its electrons are called valence electrons. The number of electrons in the valence shell of an atom is important in electricity." End quote. If enough energy is applied to a valence electron, it will move out of its orbital shell and be freed from its atom. This is where electricity comes from, the exchange of energy between electrons moving in and out of atoms. Energy that is applied to an atom's orbital shell will be distributed evenly to each electron within that shell. If there are more electrons in a valence shell, each electron will get less energy from a given source. It is this property that determines what materials conduct electricity well and are considered conductors, and what materials do not conduct electricity well and are considered insulators. Conductors have less valence electrons, and as a result, their electrons are more easily freed. The best conductors have only one valence electron. Insulators have more valence electrons, requiring more energy to free electrons and produce electricity. This brings us to another important detail, the phenomenon known as chemical stability. Orbital shells that are completely full of electrons are considered stable and won't interact chemically with other atomic shells. Orbital shells with very few electrons will tend to get rid of electrons in order that stability might be attained, while orbital shells that are nearly full will tend to gain electrons to attain stability. This leads to different chemical bonds between atoms that will share electrons with other atoms to attain stability. This is the foundation of chemistry, and is known as covalent bonding. If we take two hydrogen atoms, for example, both have one valence electron in their first shell, and could either get rid of that electron or gain an electron to achieve stability. Instead of doing one or the other, they will share their valence electron in a covalent bond. For our purposes, the important object to understand about chemical stability is that good conductors might bond chemically with other materials and will consequently act as insulators. A good example for this is that of copper and oxygen. Copper has one valence electron and oxygen needs two electrons for a full shell. Copper atoms will share their valence electrons with the oxygen nucleus, achieving stability and forming a copper oxide molecule. Copper oxide in its purest form is a near-perfect insulator. In metallic bonding, the valence electrons flow freely from atom to atom. Unlike the previously discussed covalent bonds, metallic bonds involve elements that all seek to get rid of a single valence electron, and as a result the valence electrons wander aimlessly from atom to atom, in and out of orbits. In essence, atoms in a metallic bond all share their valence electrons. If a force, such as a magnetic field, is applied to a conductor, the valence electrons will begin to move in the same direction together, producing an electric current. This is because the orbital paths of the valence electrons overlap each other and the magnetic field forces electrons from their orbitals. As they move from one orbital into another orbital, they force existing electrons in that shell onto the next shell. Those electrons force more electrons out, and so on. This process is known as the electric impulse, and the exchange of energy that occurs between electrons is near the speed of light. Although an external force might be applied to a conductor, an electric current won't flow unless there is a complete or closed circuit. If we take a battery with a conductive wire attached to the positive and negative terminals, negative charges will begin to move from the negative terminal towards the positive terminal only if the connection to the terminals is complete. If there is a break in the wire, negative charges will build up at the end of the wire connected to the negative terminal, while negative charges on the wire connected to the positive terminal will be attracted towards the positive source. As previously described, a good conductor has a low resistance to the flow of an electric current, while an insulator will be resistive to electric currents. This is going to be important in understanding what actually causes a crater to form using insulating or dielectric materials. This is also the foundation of our predictions about the surface of the Psyche asteroid. Electro Terravision has obtained copious amounts of footage demonstrating crater formation in low pressure atmospheres, in samples of dirt and sand. 
If we investigate the chemical structure of sand, we will find that it differs depending on local mineral sources, but its main constituent is silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide contains one silicon atom and two oxygen atoms. Silicon has four valence electrons which would make it a semiconductor, something that is not a good conductor or a good insulator. Oxygen has six valence electrons, therefore between two oxygen atoms, the half full shell of the silicon atom looks pretty good and both oxygens achieve stability by sharing their valence shell with the silicon. As a result, this bond, silicon dioxide, is a great electrical insulator. Well, you might be scratching your head and wondering how a good insulator would facilitate an electric current that is capable of forming a crater. We have noted, an electric current will not conduct unless there is a closed circuit. However, if there is a power source connected to an open circuit, charges will build up on the side of the negative source. In our sand experiments, the negative terminal is buried in the sand. This means that the sand would be the last material before an open circuit and we can safely assume that the sand is being charged. If there are enough charges building up in the sand, they have the ability of repelling similar charged molecules away from the source in an attempt to close the circuit. It's my speculation that this is what causes the crater to form. As the circuit closes, the dirt is at its highest electric potential, and because it is an insulating material it does not conduct the flow of electricity well. Instead, the material is machined away by the electric fields, decreasing resistance and equalizing the flow of charges from the negative source into the positive source. In the case of the Psyche asteroid, recent data has shown that 30 to 60 percent of the asteroid's composition is metallic. In our chamber experiments, the dirt is virtually free of metal. However, we have footage of experiments conducted that did contain metallic particles. This was actually a suggestion by the audience. People were curious to know the effects of metallic materials in the sand, so I obliged the audience and ordered a material that was labeled atomized copper. When the material was mixed with sand at about a 50-50% mixture, something peculiar happened. There was no crater formation. It seemed as though the copper was efficiently conducting the electric current instead of being machined away. Although the copper atoms were not metallically bonded, it would appear that doesn't need to be the case. It wasn't until the volume of copper comprised about 25% of the mixture did the craters actually form. So we might assume that since the Psyche asteroid may contain large portions of metallic materials, it will have little to no crater formation. Although it may contain some craters, they will peculiarly not be found in regions that contain high amounts of metallic materials. This is because metallic materials seem to inhibit the machining process. Now, if NASA in fact does find that there are little to no craters, they will speculate that it is because Psyche is very young and was non-existent during early bombardment periods in the solar system. NASA has already speculated that the reason Psyche is metal rich is because it was once the core of a larger body that was destroyed by hit and run bombardments. Again, if they find minimal cratering they will suggest that it did experience the bombardment period, but its heavily cratered parent body was destroyed leaving a surface that appears to have missed the bombardment. But we have already made our prediction, that is, if cratering the solar system is mostly the result of electrical activity, then a metal-rich body would experience less cratering. Directing our attention to Mars' moon Phobos, it is similar in composition to Mars, which has been found to contain silicates and metallic oxides. Because these materials are insulators, we would expect to find craters on Phobos, and that's exactly what we find. What is peculiar about Phobos' surface is the existence of extensive chains of craters, especially some that lead directly to its largest crater, Stickney. Some might scoff and say, well, that's because a large impact blasted rocks from the site and they rolled across the surface. There are some issues with this theory. The Stickney crater is said to be large enough that the impact might have actually destroyed the moon. This has led to speculation that the impact actually created stresses at the surface that caused the cratered grooves to form. Its surface gravity is also a tiny fraction of what we experience here on Earth, and the escape velocity would also be very small. We can only guess that rocks wouldn't be rolling across the surface under the conditions of a near totally destructive impact. So I say maybe, and it's a very weak maybe. In terms of the possible electrical origin, we turn to the effects of the open circuit again. Charges will build at the open end of the circuit until the charge is the same as the source. Now this charge is based on the actual amount of electrons, or lack thereof. 
The amount of charges may be called electric potential, and when two charges have a difference in potential, the electric force that results is known as the electromotive force. The unit of measurement for the electromotive force is the volt. In light of this, we might hypothesize that the crater chains are a result of the EMF at the surface. A large area of the surface is charged, with areas farther from the electrode having the highest charge. When a crater is machined, the EMF remains strongest at the surface, so another crater is machined adjacent to the original. Once again, the potential is higher at the surface, and another crater forms. This process would continue until the highest potential would exist within a crater, and that crater would continue to be machined until the power source is gone or the charges are completely equalized. This is actually the case in lab experiments. The electrodes are placed directly opposite each other and often the crater will begin to form off-center from the direct path of the electrodes. Craters will continue to form until the final crater is in the direct path of the electrodes. And since no new craters form, the final crater will continue to be machined until the power source is removed, resulting in a crater that is much larger than the craters that preceded it. I suspect that this is a result of the surface acting as an electrode, and the greatest potential is building farthest away from the electrode, much like the ends of a wire in an open circuit. I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. I'd like to take this time to inform you that I'm considering making some changes to this YouTube channel. I have other subjects that I would like to discuss and explore that aren't in the realm of electric discharge machining. I'm thinking of changing the title of the channel and placing the Electro Terravision uploads into their own playlist. Then when the name is changed, people won't complain that the channel title doesn't match the content, as the content is still going to be science material, but will also contain philosophical and thought experiment material not related to electricity. Hopefully I can get around to doing some of that. Thanks for watching.